Our scripture this morning is found in the book of Joel, Joel 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Our speaker today is Kevin Farley, who apparently is not a father yet. Not yet. <laughs> Almost. He's, he's cutting it close. <laughs> so we're happy to have him to speak with us today. Good morning, church family. Good morning. How are you doing today? Yes. I hope everyone's doing good. I really do hope everyone's doing good. I know sometimes people ask you how you're doing, and then they don't actually care what the answer is, but I really hope you are having a, a good day. It's a beautiful Sabbath out there today. Don't worry about the uh, cold weather. Um, I talked to my mother the other day up in New England. I think it was minus 20, so we got, we got nothing on them right now, and they still got snow in it. The snow that they have froze, so they got all sorts of problems up there. Um, my wife says hi to everybody. She sends her love. Um, she wishes she could be here today, but as Carly just mentioned, she is, uh, she's ready to pop any moment now, and she is praying that that baby will come any time because she is ready to have him. Uh, so we are, I'm, we're just thankful that um, he's kept her and him safe uh, throughout this whole pregnancy. It's been, it's been such a blessing. And, uh, and we want to thank everyone. Um, for all the kindness that you showed us uh, a few weekends ago at the, uh, the baby shower. It was overwhelming, and uh, we just we can't thank you enough for all the kindness that you've shown us. Um, shall we begin with a word of prayer? Father in heaven, this is your time. I know that I'm here to give the message today, Lord, that this isn't my message. And... I'm certainly not the person to give this message. I'm a sinner. And so all I can ask, Lord, is that you would hide me behind the cross and that you would put the right words in my mouth and tell me how to say them. Don't let me be here, you and you alone. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So my question is, what is happening in Pittsburgh right now? I mean, seriously, do you know what's happening in Pittsburgh right now? Are you aware? Because if you don't, I'd like to invite you to come back with me on a journey through literally the last four Sabbaths to see what God has been doing in this church and where it's leading. This is big stuff. This all began a month ago when Elder Jeff preached a sermon titled do we have a healthy church? Now, I don't know if, I know some of you know this, uh, Pastor Evan was supposed to preach that day, but he couldn't make it. And so Jeff gave the message, and he did it with a migraine, no less. In his sermon, Jeff asked us some really hard questions about our spiritual lives and for the church in general. Uh, he asked questions such as, is the Pittsburgh SDA church a duct tape church? In other words, is the Pittsburgh SDA church fulfilling its biblical purpose? Or, just like duct tape, are we doing everything but fulfilling our purpose? Jeff pointed out five points that a church fulfilling its purpose should have to meet this biblical criteria. So, number one, a healthy church needs to celebrate God's presence in worship and unity. True, heartfelt worship. Number two, we need to share God's love in ministry to each other and to everyone. We must love each other. Everyone is your neighbor. 
Number three, we need to get involved in evangelism. Not on the sidelines, because the sidelines don't count. Actually, actively involved. Number four, a healthy church should see a growth in membership. This will only happen when our lives are right with God. And number five, we need to educate in discipleship. We need to learn how to disciple someone personally and bring them to Christ. So Jeff finished his message with a challenge to all of us to intensify our personal Bible study, to refamiliarize ourselves with the spirit of prophecy. And in case we all forgot, it just so happens that the spirit of prophecy has a lot to say about the times that we're living in right now and what we should do about it. So then the next Sabbath, Brother Brian took us on a tour of the Malachi SDA Church. Do you all remember that? We got on the bus and we went off to the Malachi SDA Church. And it turns out that this church, though at first seemingly different, is pretty much like our own. It's full of people who are loved by God, but they aren't always feeling it. It's full of people thinking that they are doing church the right way, when maybe, in fact, they're on autopilot. It's full of people giving God great lip service, but maybe not giving Him the very best of what they have. It's full of people treating the Sabbath more like a trip to the dentist than a visit with the living God, our Creator. The Malachi SDA Church is full of leaders who lack commitment, members who weary the Lord with their words. Ouch. All talk, no action. It's full of people who think the grass is greener on the other side. It's full of people who blame the church and not God. I mean, I'm sorry, who blame the church and God for the things that they don't have, but probably also don't need. It's full of people who are consistently negative about God's message and his character. But then Brian pointed out to us that God's anger with the Malachi SDA church wasn't that they were belligerent or stubborn or difficult. It's that they willfully chose to be all of those things. So instead of wearing the Laodicean message in Revelation as if it were some sort of badge of honor, Brian reminded us we should take it as a warning. We should remember that God promised us that if we fear the Lord and obey Him, we will be in the book of remembrance. He mentioned Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. This is a beautiful verse. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before Him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on His name. We should unite and be of one accord. But that wasn't it. The next Sabbath after that, Rick Major came in as a guest speaker, and he preached about Jesus. Because who is central to all of these messages? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Rick reminded us that we are ambassadors of Christ. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we go and we do it in His name. He reminded us that those in the world will know us how? By the love we have one for another. You know, it's not a coincidence that this theme keeps showing up in these messages. Love for one another. Being of one accord. Rick reminded us that when Jesus is in our lives, truly, fully in our lives, we are new creatures, born again by the power of His blood, given a new life of freedom from sin, full of truth. 
He showed us that scene in John chapter 13 where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Probably one of the most beautiful scenes in the whole scripture. Because it illustrates how we are to serve as he served. He reminded us that we must not just believe, but we must also do all of these things. One of his key texts was 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, which we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Rick implored us that if we keep our focus on Jesus, if we put Jesus in his rightful place as our head, as the author, and as the finisher of our faith, we would fix a lot of the problems in our church and in our own Christian walk. The message is clear, and Rick made it very clear. He said he doesn't watch the news anymore. He's tired of breaking news. But he did say, breaking news, we need Jesus. Jesus, 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 and more Jesus. And then Brother Dave came in last week and blew the proverbial doors off. Oh boy. When I found out that I was preaching the week after Dave gave his sermon, can I just tell you how much praying I did this week? I actually had a sermon written. And Jeff texted me. Yesterday, and he said, what's the, name, what's the title of your sermon? What's your, uh, what's your passage? And I said, I don't have one. I had to scrap it. I had to get rid of it. Because I was praying about it, and I was going over it, and I said, it's not good enough. I had to do over. Dave took the gloves off. He really did. He dropped the mic. You know what dropping the mic is. You know, you get the final word. He let us have it. He started with Luke chapter 21, verses 29 to 31. And he used the parable of the fig tree to remind us of the times that we're living in. And our true condition at this moment. Folks, the fig tree is budding right now. Jesus is coming. The end, it's not near. It's now. 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 But much like all trees before they bud, he reminded us, many of us have gone dormant. And the question is, will we wake up before it's too late? Will we see the fig tree? Will we recognize the sign of the times? Will we pay attention? David recalled an actual historic, a little scary, and often forgotten example of the events of December 1888 when Alonzo T. Jones skillfully and with the Lord's strong right hand helped defeat the efforts of Senator Henry Blair and others to enact a Sunday law before the United States Senate Committee on Education and Labor and he recommended that we go and that we read through those minutes and the arguments that he gave and let me tell you he wasn't kidding that was an amazing testimony that Alonzo T. Jones gave. And it was the Holy Spirit. And the question now, of course, is how close are we to seeing this again? Probably closer than we'd like to think. David unfolded the Elijah message, uh, the Elijah message from Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I also don't think that it's a coincidence that Malachi has featured heavily in the sermons these last few Sabbaths. This Elijah message is one which is aimed right at us today. A people of complacency in the middle of a spiritual famine, a famine for the truth. 
Isn't that a problem that we actually have today? If you do happen to watch the news, if you do turn on the news, what you end up hearing all day long is a questioning of what the truth actually is. And that seems to change day to day. And really it depends on who's doing the talking. You see in the world, the very concept of truth is under attack. People don't even know what truth is anymore. Well, I mean, as David pointed out, much like in Elijah's day, there is a truth, one truth, but you'll only ever find it in one place. You know where that place is. It's right here. David then launched into the fallout of Elijah versus the prophets of Baal and Asherah in 1 Kings chapter 18. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah challenged the Israelites and ourselves, how long will you falter between two opinions? How many of us are trying to serve two masters? Elijah said in verse 21, this is very simple. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. This indifference was the worst of Israel's sins. The sin of indifference. And it's the worst of ours today, too. Because we are guilty of it. We're guilty of indifference. Now, the Lord, of course, is merciful. He gives Elijah the victory. But the follow is that Elijah, in chapter 19, is fleeing for his life from Queen Jezebel. And I take small comfort in this. Me, personally. If Elijah, the Lord's prophet, who stood boldly before the false prophets on Mount Carmel and watched the fire come from heaven and consume them, who was so zealous for the Lord, if that Elijah can have issues and crises of faith, even after the Lord has revealed himself in power, then maybe there is hope for a broken, sinful man like me. And as alone as Elijah felt, the Lord told him in chapter 19, verse 18, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Brothers and sisters, I want to give you a message of hope. I know we don't see it now, but the Lord has his people out there. And when the time is right, they will come seeking answers. They will come seeking the truth. But David asked us, will we be ready to share the truth? And will we be ready to give those answers? David reminded us that what we see happening in the world, the breakdown of society, politicians lifting themselves up as if they were saviors or other people doing it for them, people losing their families, their jobs, their lives, but especially hope. This is all the result of sin. It's a sin problem. There is no political solution to this problem. I would like to add a quote here from a, a political pundit who used to be popular years ago. And although this man knows nothing about present truth or biblical prophecy, I think he still pretty, gets, pretty much gets it right. 
This is from an article in 2015 by P.J. O'Rourke about the politician Mike Huckabee. You don't really hear his name much anymore. He was pretty popular back in the, the mid-aughts. He was part of the religious right. And it's called The Unbearable Nuttiness of Mike Huckabee. Here's the quote. This is P.J. O'Rourke speaking to him. Mike, you think God is involved in politics. Observe politics in America. Observe politics around the world. Observe politics down through history. Does it look like God is involved? No. That would be the other fellow who is the political activist. I say amen to that. Then David finished with a timely reminder. The dragon, the false prophet, and the beast from Revelation chapter thir uh, 16, verse 13, or as the reformers correctly identified them, spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and the papacy are preparing to join hands in attacking the bride of Christ. It's happening now. It is not a future event. The stage is already set. Look around you. The world was already in chaos before 2020. But even the ho-hum predictability of everyday life, even that's gone now. And it's swiftly being replaced with a new agenda. And the crux of the entire matter, in the end, will be worship. What does Satan want, truly, out of all of this? He wants worship. Wasn't that the issue at the beginning? He wanted to put himself in God's place. Brothers and sisters, that's what the end times are about. He thinks he's going to be victorious. This is a battle for the mind. Remember that. Will you choose to stand faithful with Christ, the Lamb, and the symbolic 144,000? Or will you follow after the beast in his image? Who will you serve? Remember, you cannot serve two masters. On that day, who will you worship? When Jesus comes, Will you rejoice or run for cover? Now, these are four very powerful messages to get in a row. It's a lot to get your head around. And I didn't give you this summary because I wanted to plagiarize these messages. I wanted to take Jeff's challenge seriously. I wanted to go over those messages again and digest them and understand them. Because moving forward, folks, if this is a revival, I pray that this is not a revival just for Pittsburgh, but for this entire area. Because this whole area needs a revival. I am thankful, and I rejoice that this spirit has taken hold. But as several of these speakers have reminded us, words are not enough. We must hear and believe and then act. So here's my question. These are my words now. Well, not my words. What next? If you, wherever you are, feel like you are moved to act upon these very timely messages, what would the Lord have you do now? I submit that the answer is simple. And some of us may even be doing it right now. It's a four-letter word. Starts with the letter P. Pray. 
with all of your heart. Pray with all of your might. I want to share with you a passage that has been on my mind a lot lately, even before these revival sermons. Yeah, that was me. Get too excited up here. In Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 121, Ellen White has this to say. A revival of true godliness amongst us is the greatest and the most urgent of all of our needs. Amen. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord. Not because God is not willing to bestow His blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessing. A revival should only be expected an answer to prayer. On page 122, she continues, The old standard bearers knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer and to enjoy the outpouring of His Spirit. But these men and women are passing off from the stage of action. And who are coming up to fill their places? How is it with the rising generation? Are they converted to God? Are we awake to the work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? Or are we waiting for some compelling power to come upon the church before we will arouse? Are we hoping to see the whole church revived? These are chilling words at the end here. That time will never come. Why do you think she would say such a thing? Are we hoping to see the whole church revived? She says, that time will never come. There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will never unite in earnest, prevailing prayer. We must enter upon the work individually. We must pray more and talk less. Iniquity abounds, and people must be taught not to be satisfied with a form of godliness without the Spirit and the power. If we are intent upon searching our own hearts, putting away our sins, and correcting our evil tendencies, our souls will not be lifted up unto vanity. We would be distrustful of even ourselves having an abiding sense that our sufficiency is not of us, but of God alone. Brothers and sisters, I want to put an exclamation point on the subject of revival. It can happen. If we want it to, it will happen. If we're willing to finally put all things aside and humble ourselves and repent. We can see it, not just in our lifetimes, but now. What are we waiting for? Continuing in Selected Messages on page 124, Sister White then says, this is the key. Remember this, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out His Spirit upon a languishing church 
and an impenitent congregation. Brothers and sisters, did you hear those words? Satan is afraid. Can somebody say amen? amen? If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. But we are not ignorant of his devices. It is possible to resist his power. When the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come. Satan can no more hinder a shower of blessing from descending upon God's people than he can close the windows of heaven so that rain should not come upon the earth. Wicked men and devils cannot hinder the work of God. They cannot shut out his presence from the assemblies of his people. If they will, with subdued, contrite hearts, confess and put away their sins and in faith claim his promises. Every temptation, every opposing influence, whether open or secret, may be successfully resisted, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice how Sister White says, if they will. We can claim all of these promises of Holy Spirit power. We can resist every temptation and opposition, but only only if we are also willing to confess our sins. Repent completely. Put them away. Have humble, contrite hearts. And then claim these amazing promises. Which would also mean, conversely, that if we don't do these things, we can be 100% sure they will never happen. I want to bring you to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Please turn there with me. I'll give them a minute to call it up on the screen too so we can read it together. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Let's read this together. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain or if I command the locusts to devour the land or if I send pestilence among my people if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. That's a promise. That's a promise. It was a promise for the children of Israel back then. It's a promise for us now. Our scripture reading, Joel chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. 
There's a word in there that strikes me to my very core. Rending of the heart. Heart rending. It's genuine. It's powerful. It's the real deal. It can't be faked. It requires something that I dare say most of us <clears throat> in our daily devotion are incapable of mustering up. It excludes the very notion of laziness or complacency. Look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 to 44. On Gethsemane. That is heart rending prayer. Literally. Jesus' heart broke in that garden. Look at Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. Wrestling with God. The kind of prayer that made Jacob an overcomer and caused his name to be changed to Israel, the overcomer. Look at Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 to 18, praying to the Lord and weeping in anguish for a son to be born. Or the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 who first received and then lost her miracle child, coming to Elijah in anguish and grief, pleading to the Lord to intervene. Or how about King David in Psalm 51, praying for forgiveness for a new heart after committing adultery and murder. Or Daniel, a man of royal lineage, captive in a foreign land, praying and repenting before the Lord for his people's salvation and restoration in Daniel chapter 9. The New Testament church was bathed in prayer. In Acts chapter 1, they waited and they prayed in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit descended upon them in power, in tongues of fire, as promised. In Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John were arrested, the believers gathered together and prayed for a renewal of boldness. Let's put that up on the screen too. Acts chapter 4, verses 29 to 31. Acts chapter 4, verses 29 to to 31. This is their prayer. Now, Lord, these are the believers praying. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. I don't know if I'll ever see it in my lifetime before Jesus comes, but if I have one prayer for anything... You know, we all have a thing in the Bible that we look at and we think, oh boy, I'd love to see that. I would love to see a group of believers in a room praying with such intensity that the room shook. Prayer led Peter to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. 
And through intercessory prayer, Peter was freed from his prison. The early Advent movement was built upon a foundation of prayer, sometimes lasting into and through the night. This prayer, together with repentance and fasting, led to a great power and a light being granted to that growing movement. In Life Sketches, page 137, Ellen White talks about William Miller's lectures in Portland, Maine and the prayer and the revival which followed it. She says, Terrible conviction spread through the entire city of Portland. Prayer meetings were established. And there was a general awakening among the various denominations, for they all felt more or less the influence that proceeded from the teaching of the coming of Christ. At the prayer meetings established throughout the city, petitioners often stayed early morning until late at night. Prayer meetings were set up all over the city. Brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh. Let me finish by saying this. My wife and I are, are new here, relatively speaking. But I thank God for this church. And I thank God for the way that you have all lovingly embraced us. The baby shower that you guys had for Ariette and I brought tears to my eyes. You have so quickly and so completely embraced us. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love you. I may not know all of you as well as I would like, but I know this. I am here amongst true brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Rejoice! Rejoice, Pittsburgh! The spirit of revival has been ignited amongst you. Amen. Rejoice. Amen. Rejoice. Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise Him with great praise. Lord, Lord. Thank you. I know you believe it. I know you do. But let us be vigilant and careful as we move forward. Because the enemy hates what is happening here. And he will do everything in his power to stop it. Pray. Heart-rending. Humiliating. Earnest. Prayer. will be the beginning of this revival. It will sustain this revival. It will nurture this revival. And it will certainly follow this revival. I don't even know where this quote comes from. But I pray to get it that we can engage in agonizing, hell-robbing, earth-shaking, heaven-sent, intercessory prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.